Yakuza 4, a game that would drastically change the focus, character, and story for the series. It would disrupt the current formula and change things for the better. Not only would it evolve, but the story, gameplay, and side content were all at the top of their game in this entry. Today, I'm going to dive deep into Yakuza 4, talking about gameplay, mechanics, story, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my previous videos on the Yakuza series, it would probably be a good idea to go back and watch those first to get some good context. If you enjoy the video, please consider liking and subscribing as it really helps the channel out. If you want to support the channel, you can go subscribe over on Patreon, where I upload longer cuts of my full retrospectives and monthly updates. Spoilers for Yakuza 4. Hey dad, it's me your favorite son, and today I want to talk about Yakuza 4. In 2009, the next game in the Yakuza series was announced as in development by Sega. It was revealed at the 2009 Tokyo Game Show as Ryu ga Gotoku 4 Densetsu wo Sugomono, or Like a Dragon 4, the successor to the legend, or, as we know it, Yakuza 4. The new entry would make many different, large changes for the series overall, but the first was focused on Kamurocho itself. The team wanted to add another dimension to the city, making it feel like a bustling urban environment. Director Jun Orihara stated that the underground and above-ground areas were intended to defy imagination, giving you the sense of being beneath a bustling urban district. The team also wanted to revolutionize the formula by adding to the already large cast that Yakuza presented. Three new protagonists would be introduced, allowing players to not just play as Kiryu, but Akiyama, Saijima, and Tamimura. Three new characters with unique personalities, storylines, and battle styles. The team wanted to build the new protagonists from the ground up, forming strong archetypes and character arcs. Music director Hidenori Shoji said that one of the most important pieces that differentiated each character were their sound design. Different composers were assigned to each protagonist to give them all a unique feel and make sure they felt like separate people. Yakuza 4 was released on March 18, 2010 in Japan, March 15, 2011 in North America, and March 18, 2011 in Europe for the PlayStation 3. A few notes before we get into the game. First is the structure of these retrospectives. If you haven't seen my previous videos on the Yakuza series, which you should, then I'd like to explain the structure of my reviews on these games. Yakuza is known for its story and gameplay, tales that tug at the heartstrings and character development that creates realistic and interesting people over time. Its combat is engaging, fun, and exciting, with battle systems developed to reflect those interesting characters and also make you feel like a powerful warrior battling on the streets of Kamurocho. But outside of those, it's also known for its incredibly fun, interesting, and addicting side content. These distractions are lengthy and well-developed, providing an entire game's worth of content on their own. Because of this, I'll first be going through the main game, diving deep into its plot and gameplay. At the end of the video, we'll go back to talk in-depth about all of the distractions that this entry presents, as they are some of my favorite parts of the Yakuza games overall. Second is the version of Yakuza 4 that I'll be playing. Yakuza 4 was originally released on PlayStation 3, but was re-released as part of a remastered collection worldwide on October 29th, 2019 for the PlayStation 4, and later in 2021 for PC. This remastered collection allowed for play on the next generation of console, increasing the 
graphics and frame rate slightly, and it's also just a more accessible version of the game, and doesn't present any serious changes or problems. One of the things that should be noted is that one of the new protagonist's appearance was changed for the remaster. Hiroki Naramiya originally provided the likeness for Tamimura, and when he received allegations of drug use, he retired from acting and thus had to be replaced with Toshiki Masuda for the remaster. Yakuza 4 starts by introducing our first new protagonist, Shun Akiyama, the infamous loan shark. Akiyama is a money lender. He gives people loans, and while that might seem a little unsavory for our first new protagonist, we'll see here pretty soon that that isn't the whole story. Akiyama is a bit of a slacker, and is having an easy day reading magazines and taking naps. He's getting calls from his assistant, Hana, and she's reminding him that it's an important day, collection day. He needs to get out and make his rounds, collecting on the money that he's lent out. He says he was waiting for the rain to stop, but it stopped raining hours ago. As Akiyama steps outside, it begins raining again, of course. Akiyama heads out on the town to begin his collections, when some thugs from a rival moneylender, Kamarocho Loans, stops him. This is when we realize the true nature of Akiyama's business. He's taking clients from the other firms because he offers loans without interest, and they just can't hold up. But these guys use unsavory tactics and fear to get their money back. Akiyama can hold his own, though, and beats them down with no issue. On his way to the hotel district, Akiyama sees a young kid that he knows, Takeshi Kido, who is part of Kanamura Enterprises, a second-tier family of the Tojo clan. Akiyama heads into the business to see what's going on, and overhears a conversation between the punks there. Kido is worried about the Ueno Saiwa clan, who are causing trouble at Club Elnard. Akiyama finally enters and asks if the family boss and Arai, the captain, are there. But the boss is out and Arai is meeting with the head of the Shibata family, trying to get Kanamura Enterprises in on Kamurocho Hills. Akiyama gives the lower ranks of Kanamura some wise advice. He tells them exactly what the Ueno Saiwa clan are doing. They're undermining the upper ranks of the Tojo by causing trouble. The younger members get it, and Akiyama delivers a message to Kanamura, that if he keeps letting this happen, his family won't last long. Akiyama realized that Kanamura wasn't out, but just in the other room watching TV, and says this just loud enough so that he hears it. After Akiyama leaves, Kanamura tells Kido to deal with the Ueno Saiwa. The new member of the family asks Kanamura who Akiyama is, and we get some good backstory on our new protagonist. Akiyama is a bit unorthodox in his lending practices. He lends to people that other brokers turn away entirely. He also doesn't charge interest on loans and usually makes people go through some sort of test before he lends to them, making sure they're worthy of using the money. No one that borrows from Akiyama and Sky Finance in general ever comes back for more money. Akiyama is heading to the local convenience store to buy beers and snacks for the homeless at a camp near Kamarocho Hills. He spends some time with them and sees Arai, the captain of Kanamura Enterprises, walking with Shibata, the patriarch of the Shibata family. Arai gets a call about the Ueno Saiwa at Club Elnard, and Akiyama tails him as he heads there. Inside, the Ueno Saiwa men, Ihara and Mishima, are getting rowdy with the hostesses. Akiyama mocks them, and he eventually knocks Mishima out. It seems that there's some sort of deal that Ihara has with someone, but Akiyama doesn't know what it is. Akiyama tells him that his attack on him would have been a declaration of war if he was a Yakuza, but since he's a citizen, he can fight Ihara all he wants. After Kido comes in and Ihara tells him to stay out of it, we have our first mini-boss fight of the game. I should probably go over the basics of combat before we get into this fight. I have to say that I'll be stopping to talk about combat for each of the characters as we get into their stories, as all of their fighting styles are unique and individual. Overall, the battle system carries the same fundamentals as each other Yakuza entry. 
Basic attacks combined with heavy ones will provide finishing moves and combos, which are the bread and butter of our offense. We can block or evade to mitigate damage. Heat actions have of course returned, which use our heat gauge to deliver a powerful and punishing blow to the enemy when prompted. We can taunt enemies or charge up to increase our heat gauge, or increase it through general combat, landing blows, or blocking. Near the end of a boss battle, we'll get the ability to charge up our heat bar by completing quick time prompts and deliver a finishing blow to the enemy. The upgrade system has been changed from the first three original entries, and serves as an interesting evolution of the previous systems. We gain experience through fighting, completing sub-stories, and mini-games. When this experience causes us to level up, we get soul orbs. These soul orbs can be spent to gain new abilities for each character. Some of these abilities are locked and can only be unlocked through training or by unlocking preceding abilities. But for the most part, we can unlock abilities in the order that we choose. This adds a large freedom to the ability system that wasn't present in the previous three original entries, not focusing on the Kiwami remakes here. I think this would serve as a good turn and basis for the upgrade systems moving forward, and would cause the Yakuza games to take a much better path with combat in general. One downside though to the whole upgrade system is the UI. There are a ton of different panels here to flip through, but the actual list is pretty short. This is because a lot of the upgrades are repeated on separate panels, and for what reason, I'm not sure. They're divided into heat, body, technique, and soul, but there's also four other panels that have some random assortment of abilities, and then a panel that has all of them. It's not the worst thing in the world, and I know I'm nitpicking slightly here, but it's just kind of slightly confusing to navigate and isn't very cohesive at all. As I said though, each character has their own individual style, their own upgrades, their own individual training master. Akiyama's style is very much about speed and using his legs. Most of his attacks are only using his legs, and he's very agile in general. He's one of my favorite characters to fight with in this entry, and I really loved using him overall. His finishing move can be upgraded to add multiple leg kicks to the end, delivering a powerful 7-hit combo and just destroying lower-ranked goons in a flash. He also has some fantastic and walloping heat actions to deliver overall. Ihara isn't that difficult, though, and Yakuza 4 has largely fixed the blocking issues that the previous game had. Ihara doesn't hit that hard, and with a plethora of tables and chairs around the club, we have tons of weapons at our disposal to use against him. After the battle, Arai shows up, the captain of Kanemura Enterprises. The two have a conversation, Akiyama telling Arai that he wants Kanemura out of the Tojo clan, and he thinks that Arai has the skills to make a big name for himself in the Yakuza. Akiyama thinks he might even be able to rival the dragon of Dojima himself. Arai thinks that being the patriarch of Kanemura won't get him there, but Akiyama disagrees. Ihara then gets up and pulls a gun on Akiyama. Before he can be shot, Arai pushes him out of the way. Kuna! Kuna! Ihara and Mishima make a run for it, and Akiyama and Kido help Arai. It was only a graze, and the man is fine, but Kido rushes off after the two regardless. Before he leaves, he tells Arai to remind Kanemura of the loan terms. Akiyama heads out, and Hana is calling him, complaining that he's taking too long to finish collections. Hana doesn't want to leave for the day because some men are fighting outside, and she says one of them has a gun. Akiyama figures that they're Ueno Saiwa men and heads back to Sky Finance. Akiyama hears a gunshot and finds Arai standing over Ihara's body. He says that he was wrong about him making it big, as this murder will sink him now. He leaves the alley and another man shows up, telling him to get out of here before the cops come. Akiyama doesn't take this advice, and the cops drag him away, the mystery man saying that Suguichi won't go easy on him. We jump back to December 2005, during the events of the first game in the series. 
Akiyama is homeless in Kamurocho and sees the explosion at the Millennium Tower, money raining down on the streets. He rushes to the pavement to grab as much as he can. This is how he got the money to start Sky Finance, and before that, he had nothing. Back in present day, Akiyama is in a jail cell getting released. Suguichi, the man that Akiyama was warned about, says that Hana has cleared his name. On his way out, he tells him to stop causing trouble around town. He tells the man that he won't stop lending money to those who need it, and Suguichi says that Kanamura is dead. The police won't help Akiyama if he doesn't stay away from the Yakuza altogether. Akiyama receives a call from Hana on the way back to the office, and she's complaining because she has so much paperwork to do. Akiyama heads back to help her, but she's nowhere to be found and his lunch is cold. He finds a picture of him and his friends from the past when looking for a lighter and leans back. A woman walks through the door at this point, a new customer, dressed conspicuously. She wants a loan, and Akiyama thinks she looks just like the woman in the photo he has. The woman is pretty cagey about how much money she wants and doesn't let that information out quickly. The woman says she used to work at Drama Queen, a bar in the Champion District. After a while, she finally lets it out. She needs 100 million yen within the next 10 days. For reference, that's roughly 736 thousand United States dollars. Nakayama doesn't say no to this request, but he wants the woman to pass a test just like everyone else. He gets a call from Kido during their conversation, who just got released after being questioned about Kanamura's murder. They agree to meet up later and discuss the situation. Akiyama tells the woman to come back tomorrow so that he can have some time to come up with the parameters of her test. As she leaves, she tells him to call her Lily. On the roof, Akiyama calls the local club that he is invested in, called Elise. He tells them he has a girl he wants to start there tomorrow. Hana arrives and the two begin to finally get some work done. Akiyama and Kido meet up on the roof of a building by the Kamurocho Theater. Neither of them can believe that Arai would kill Ihara like that. The night before, Kido went back to the office to regroup after they lost the Ueno Saiwa men. When he arrived, no one was there and the place was dead silent. That was when he found his boss lying dead in the offices. The police believe the killer to be a woman because he died shirtless with lipstick marks all over him. Kido thinks it doesn't add up because the boss never expressed interest in women, but Akiyama thinks it could be a femme fatale. Some Shibata men show up wanting to take the boys in for the business with Arai. Kido run back to Sky Finance while he deals with the Yakuza. The police show up and Sugiuchi scolds Akiyama for getting involved with the Yakuza again. They're about to take him away and Akiyama makes a run for it. We have our first chase sequence of the game and these work virtually the same as the previous entry, except this time we don't have a dash. We just run forward and if we're running away, that's it. If we're chasing someone, we have the ability to tackle them and wear down their stamina until our character brings them to the ground. There is one new addition in this entry, and that's quick turns. We can use the R1 button and hold the left stick in a direction to quickly turn that way, giving our character a speed burst. It works pretty well most of the time, but often I would find it finicky and difficult to navigate. An interesting addition that I should note here, that I also briefly covered in the development section, is the changes to Kamarocho. We don't have any other new cities in this entry, most of the story taking place in Kamurocho itself. No Sotenbori or Okinawa. That being said, Kamurocho has been greatly upgraded, with some entirely new areas added into the mix. We can now traverse the roofs of the city and the underground of the city. A new parking lot and shopping mall has been added underground with a couple new shops, and not too much has been added to the roofs. It's a nice little addition that makes the city feel a lot larger, and largely does what the team set out to do. These two additions don't serve much use now, but will be extremely useful in a different protagonist's later chapters. Akiyama arrives back at Sky Finance, sands the police officers, and collapses on the couch. Akiyama and Kido are called down to the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department for questioning. Kido thinks something is off about Sugiuchi, because he's pursuing Kanamura and Akiyama hard. He's questioning how they met and probing pretty deep. 
Akiyama doesn't say much, and it's revealed that Sugiyuchi was listening to them after they leave. Sugiyuchi is at Sky Finance when Akiyama arrives, informing him that there's a 24-hour surveillance on the place. The Shibata family is out to get him, and Captain Katsuragi of the Ueno Saiwa is too. Earlier, Daigo offered Katsuragi a pile of cash and one of Shibata's fingers as compensation for Ihara's death. Katsuragi refused and wanted Arai's head or Kamurocho Hills as payment. This is why Suguuchi is trying to keep tabs on Akiyama, because now the Tojo clan too are looking for Arai, and he needs to watch everyone that knew him. Akiyama asks if he's digging this deep because he has a promotion coming up, and Suguuchi takes his leave. Lily arrives and Akiyama wants to make sure she's ready for the deal before they begin her test. Akiyama tells her that her test is to go on a date with him and shop for some new clothes. He takes her out on the town and then to Elise, where he reveals that she has to work at the club to bring in 3 million yen in 3 days, and then she can have the money. She eventually agrees, and he leaves her there for her first shift. She brings in half a million on her first night, but she's going to have to get a lot better very fast if she wants to make enough to pass the test. The two meet up and head to the champion district, but Lily spots a place she hasn't been and the two go inside. On the roof, she says she does remember this place, but the city has changed a lot and the previously tallest building now feels so short. She used to live there when she was broke, and she asks Akiyama why men are always looking up and forgetting the women at their side. He says it's because it's hard to make the people that you love happy if you have no money. A lot of Akiyama's story has to do with money, and it's hard not to. The man became rich because of a fluke. Fortune literally fell into his lap one day. He went from nothing to everything in an instant, and with all of that money, he decided to use it for good. Lily too cares a lot about money, for what reason we're not sure, but she wishes that she didn't. She wants to go back to simpler times. Akiyama asks if he can make her happy, not with his money, but with himself, and he goes in for the kiss. Akiyama says he hasn't felt this way in five years, since his last girlfriend. At the worst time possible, some Shibata men arrive and interrupt the two. Akiyama defeats them, and the two run away to the public park. The two have had their fill for the night, and he tells Lily to head home, and he'll check in on her tomorrow after her shift. Kido returns to Sky Finance the next day. Akiyama fills him in on the situation, and Kido says they haven't found Arai. Kido wonders why the Tojo clan doesn't just let the Ueno Saiwa find and kill Arai, as it would get them off their backs, and he's a liability. Kido doesn't want him to be the clan's sacrifice, though. Akiyama gives him some money to go find Arai, and Kido is suspicious as to why he's being so helpful. We learn that Arai saved Akiyama's life six years ago. Akiyama used to be an investment broker when he was young, but he was framed for embezzlement and fired. He used the rest of his savings trying to clear his name and ended up on the streets. When the Millennium Tower bombing gave him affluence, some homeless hunters in the city robbed him. Arai was the one who tracked them down and returned Akiyama's money. Akiyama has great respect for him and still thinks that he'll do great things for Kamurocho. Akiyama thinks that Kamurocho needs someone to aspire to, someone to keep their visions high, and he believes Arai is that man, the one to fill the shoes of Kiryu. Kido leaves to look for Arai, and Hana returns. Akiyama wants to go check up on Lily, but Hana tells him to collect from Mirimba, a bar that is three days late on their loans. The place is closed when he arrives, and he sees Drama Queen as he's leaving, the bar that Lily used to work at. He finds out the bar is an Okama bar, where men dress up as women. When he goes in to ask the manager about Lily, he finds the man dead. We get to investigate the scene, and we find the Shibata family crest on his jacket and a missing lighter. Akiyama arrives back at Sky Finance to find the place ransacked and Hana on the ground. Kido came back to run some things by Akiyama, and some thugs came in and attacked her. Akiyama thinks that it was the Shibata family, but she says their leader was Midorikawa, a member of the Hatsushiba family, allied with Shibata. They took the client registry and Kido with them. 
Akiyama heads out to look for them, and he finds some homeless men that tell him they went into the underground. The main entrance is locked, but they tell him to use the tunnels under the Millennium Tower's basement. Akiyama finds the Hatsushiba family, and he has to fight his way through them. He's attacked by Sugekawa, a homeless man who is trying to take the place back from the Yakuza, as it used to be a homeless haven. The two work together to take the thugs down. Akiyama finds Midori Kawa, Kido, and the Hatsushiba chairman. We fight Midori Kawa, and he's kind of an insane battle. He uses a ton of punches that are strong and can't be knocked down yet. Halfway through, he runs and grabs a chainsaw, making the battle that much more wacky. We take him down regardless, and Hatsushiba tries to escape with the client registry. Akiyama doesn't let him get away, and we find out he was doing this as a favor to Shibata. Shibata really wanted to know where Lily was, and since she was a client of Akiyama's, he figured that her information would be in the book. Akiyama tells Kido to head home, and he gets a call from the manager of the club, Elise. He says that Lily has met her goal of earning $3 million at the club, and he tells her to meet him on the top of the Millennium Tower so he can give her the money. When she arrives, he gives her the money, and she tells him that she originally planned to just take the money and run, but she's given him hope again. She promises to pay the money back, but Akiyama says she doesn't have to worry about it. He just wants to change people's lives and make them happier. Akiyama asks her one question before she leaves, though. Why did she kill the drama queen manager? She chooses to pay him back instead of telling him the truth and says she's leaving town to take care of business. Akiyama has gone through a lot. That much is clear. He's been wronged by multiple people, framed, broken up with, and even trusted Arai when he shouldn't have. But he still chooses to go on, to trust people and help them be better. He wants to get people back on their feet because he was on the top and then on the bottom, and he knows what it's like to be in both places. He has perspective. When he gets back to the office, Hana is enraged that he thinks Lily won't pay the money back. Akiyama doesn't really seem to care and says it's his company so he can do what he likes. She leaves to quit and he chases her to the park. She says he's just playing favoritism because the girl looks just like his ex, Eri, who left when he went bankrupt and was only in it for the money. He says that isn't the case, but she still thinks she needs to leave because their working relationship is poor. The manager of Club Elise calls and says that he needs Akiyama quick because some Yakuza are looking for Lily and making a mess of the place. One of them is singing karaoke, Daisaku Minami of the Majima family. <laughs> Akiyama turns off the machine and Minami tells him that he's looking for Lily, as Majima wanted her brought back to the HQ. Akiyama refuses and we get our final battle of Akiyama's part of the story. This one can be kind of tricky because Minami is fast and will dodge slash block a lot of our attacks. He also likes to drink and blow fire out at us, which can do a ton of damage if it hits. When he's defeated, the Mad Dog himself shows up, genuinely disappointed that Lily is gone. リリに一体何の用ですリリは柴田組に追われていたまさか真島さんあんたもそのことに関係しているんですかそうなんか柴田組が教えてください真島さん リリは一体何者なんですかなぜあんたたちに追われなきゃならないんですかあいつは安子ちゃんは俺が守らなあかんねや。When Akiyama asks why they're all after her, he says he has to keep Yasuko safe after his screw up in 1985 which won't make sense for a bit. With that, the first part of our story is over. Yakuza 4 is split into four parts, each protagonist taking the helm of one. Their stories are told individually and then woven together near the end. The next part of our story centers on Taiga Saijima. 
We jump back to April 20th, 1985. Saijima is a member of the Sasai family of the Tojo and is visited by his good friend Goro Majima, who you'll notice still has both eyes. He brings some watermelon for them to enjoy. Saijima sends Yasuko out for some beer and Majima shows the gift he brought, six revolvers and plenty of bullets. The two are planning to off Yoshiharu Ueno and the Saiwa clan itself. They seem to be planning to go up against 10 men at once, and Majima wants to make sure that Saijima is ready for this. Majima doesn't have that many friends in the Yakuza yet and is ready to go, but Saijima has Yasuko to look after. Saijima says that the clan is the only thing that matters and seeing how far he can rise. The next day, Saijima shows up to a ramen shop where the hit is going to take place. Majima isn't there and he goes to a payphone to call and see what's going on, but Ueno shows up and brought much more than 10 men. Saijima goes without Majima and storms in, armed to the teeth, literally. This whole scene is insane, watching this huge bulk of a man almost get taken down by multiple Yakuza, but he overcomes them, gunning them down and wiping out the Ueno clan in one fell swoop. He pulls guns out of every spot, holsters, waistband, his mouth, it's nuts. He finally corners Ueno and puts a bullet into him. We learn soon after this that Saijima turned himself in and he didn't give them any information to link it to the Tojo clan. He was given 18 counts of murder and sentenced to death, but that didn't happen right away. And 25 years later, in the present day of our story, he's being moved to a new prison. Saijima arrives at Okinawa Penitentiary Number 2, where the sergeant of the guard tells him to await his execution. Saijima is confronted at dinner by some Ueno men who are pretty upset he killed their leader. We get our first fight with Saijima and get to see exactly how much power this hulk of a man has, and the battle system that controlling him presents. Saijima fights much different than Akiyama. He's not quick and agile, he's slow and powerful. He delivers large, time-consuming hits that do a bit more damage. Now, I'll say this. Saijima started out as my least favorite character to play with, and became my favorite over time. When we first get him, he's honestly terrible to use. His hits are slow, and he just gets smashed by everything. He's always knocked down, and he's not fast enough to dodge hits or land hits before the enemy attacks. His main new ability is that his finishing blow can be charged to deliver a much more powerful blow. This is pretty good, and he mostly can't be knocked down when he's charging up, so it can be pretty useful. This gets even better when we add one or two more hits to that finishing blow, and this 7-hit combo can just decimate enemies quick, but it takes quite a while for him to get there. Saijima defeats the Ueno men because they didn't know who they were picking a fight with. Saijima is taken away and beaten by Saito, but the warden stops him because he doesn't want Saito to kill another prisoner. Shortly after, Saijima has a visitor, none other than Go Hamazaki. If you watched my previous Yakuza video or played Yakuza 3 yourself, you'll know this is the man that stabbed Kiryu at the end of the game. He tells Saijima that this place he's in is off the map. It's funded by shady money and is not on official records, a dumping ground where men are sent to die. Hamazaki eventually reveals that he needs Saijima's help. Before he tells him what he needs, he informs Saijima that he didn't completely finish off the Ueno clan. Two of the 20 men survived, and they're now a close partner of the Tojo clan. The Sasai family, the one that Saijima was a part of, crumbled, and even worse, Majima purposefully betrayed him to get rid of him. The next day, Hamazaki tells Saijima that he wants to escape. His plan is to have Saijima distract the guards and take them out while Hamazaki raids the warden's office for something that he needs. Then, they'll use a grappling hook and climb the walls. The only issue is that he doesn't have a grappling hook, and he's leaving it up to Saijima to handle that part of the plan. 
We talk to Kamiyama, who bears a remarkable resemblance to the man we've met in previous games, who sells weapons in Kamurocho and Okinawa. Apparently, this is his brother, though, and he offers to build the grappling hook. First, he needs a chain and points us to another prisoner that he saw with one. We have to fight the prisoner for it, and then he needs a gardening hoe. One of the inmates is on farm duty and has one, but he also wants to fight for it. Getting both of these materials leaves Kamiyama to build the hook for us, and Hamazaki has us stash it in the yard. That night, the plan goes off without a hitch. Hamazaki slips past the guards in a stolen uniform, while Saijima has to fight the group of guards that come to calm him down. We rampage our way through the halls of the penitentiary and find Hamazaki in the warden's office. He finds some documents that prove the Okinawa penitentiary exists, and the two continue making their way through the place. They have to make their way across the roof at a certain point, and this part was incredibly frustrating. There's a sniper in a tower that's taking shots every chance he gets. Fighting enemies and trying to avoid this can be pretty rough, and every time we get hit, we're downed. It's incredibly annoying, and I actually remember quitting the game at this very point years ago when I played it for the first time. Eventually, the two make their way to the yard and set up their grappling hook. Hamazaki climbs up, but just as he reaches the top, the guards arrive, and the sergeant Saito himself. We have our first boss battle as Saijima here, and Saito can be a bit of a pain. He dodges incredibly well, grabs a lot, and most of his attacks stun us, so getting around all that is pretty difficult. Not to mention we're in prison, so the healing items are in short supply. Once he goes down, Saijima climbs up the chain, but he's too weak to make it to the top, with his recent battle so close in the rearview mirror. Just as he's about to fall, though, Hamazaki pulls him back up. He asks him why he didn't just run, and he said that abandoning him would leave a bad taste in his mouth. They throw the grappling hook down into the sea, and Hamazaki lets Saijima go first, since he has more to lose. On the way down, he tells Saijima that they should take on the Tojo clan when they get home. And at this point, Saito arrives and shoots him. He tells Saijima to find a man named Kiryu when he gets out, calling him a dependable guy. You didn't think he was that dependable when you fucking stabbed him, did you? Anyways, he uses his last bit of strength to tackle Saito off of the wall, and Saijima jumps into the sea. Saijima survives the swim and washes up on the beaches of Okinawa, specifically Morning Glory Orphanage. Haruka discovers him and treats his wounds. When he wakes up, she tells him that her uncle is talking to the cops to see if there's a shipwreck or something last night, and for some reason, he knocks her over and... Stop. 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 This whole scene is really awkward, and I know what it's trying to illustrate, because they even state it later, that Saijima has been in prison for 25 years and hasn't seen a woman in, well, 25 years. Why? Haruka is literally 14 years old in this game, and Saijima is 45. It's foul. After that, Kiryu arrives, and the two have their first conversation. Kiryu starts asking questions about what happened last night, and realizes he's being rude before introducing himself. Saijima realizes this is the man he's supposed to be looking for, and introduces himself with a fake name, Suzuki. He makes up a story about a shipwreck and says he was supposed to look for Kiryu if he needed help. Kiryu asks him some probing questions and realizes pretty quickly that he's lying. He also saw what happened with Haruka, which just makes the situation that much more awkward. That being said, he relates to Saijima, as he was in jail for 10 years. He eventually tells him to turn himself in, and Saijima says he can't because he wants to get revenge on those that wronged him. Kiryu says he won't help him because vengeance brings misery and the two do battle. Our first time fighting Kiryu feels kind of like a Nero versus Dante moment. We finally get to go up against the all-powerful, the greatest, that we've been playing for three games now, and he's pretty strong. He uses a ton of heat actions and Komaki moves, even though he doesn't have them when we play as him later. Eventually, we beat him, but it's a false victory, because the battle ends in a draw, Haruka breaking it up before they can finish, and Saijima collapsing from his wounds. Saijima mentions Hamazaki, and Kiryu takes him back to the orphanage so he can recover. Haruka and Kiryu are talking while Saijima rests. Haruka realizes that Saijima and Hamazaki are friends, and she doesn't think she can trust him. 
Kiryu thinks that Hamazaki could have turned over a new leaf, or just because Saijima knows Hamazaki doesn't make him a bad guy too, and they shouldn't judge too soon. Kiryu decides to head out, and Haruka doesn't think she should be left alone with Saijima. Kiryu says it's fine, and I think I disagree with him here. I mean, come on, the dude just escaped from prison, and you barely know him. All the other kids are gone, and you're going to leave Haruka with him after he stared longingly into her eyes and cried? Ew. This turns out to not be the truth, though, because when Saijuma wakes up, Haruka gives him a bag from Kiryu with a change of clothes, a letter, and some money. He gets dressed, and before he leaves, he tells Haruka his real name, and we see Kiryu overlooking the whole thing. I still think he should have at least told Haruka his plan and not forced her to, you know, whatever. Saijuma finally arrives back in Kamurocho and heads to the Sasai family office to see what's become of his old crew. Their offices aren't even there anymore, and some homeless man tells him to find Toku in the underground mall, as he's been around a long time and he might know where they are. Toku wants us to get him some booze and doesn't have any idea where the Sasai family is, so Saijima heads back to his old apartment. Now, Saijima's part is kind of strange, because he's on the run from the police. Fittingly, there are cops all over Kamurocho, and we have to avoid them, otherwise we'll get into a chase. Avoiding them isn't too hard for most of the game, but if it suits us, we can use the rooftops to get around, or the underground to traverse the city and stay away from the police. I never really had to do this for most of Saijima's story. Walking around the streets and looking ahead was enough for me. This whole traveling predicament will come to a head later in Saijima's story, but we'll get there. When he gets back to his apartment, Kido is seen being put on by some Shibata family members. Saijima tries to ask him about Sasai, his old boss, but he runs away out of fear that he's with the Ueno Saiwa. We chase Kido through the streets in kind of an odd sequence. Kido doesn't have a destination, so he just kind of runs back and forth sometimes, but we get him down anyways. Kido fills Saijima in on the last few days and asks Saijima what the Sasai family is, as he's never heard of them. Saijima explains his backstory, and Kido realizes that he's the legendary hitman that took down 18 men in one go. Saijima just wants to find Sasai before he dies, and Kido takes him down to his hideout so he can give him some more information. His hideout is actually the old Hatsushiba offices, and in here, he tells him about the florist of Sai, and that he might have information on Sasai. Kido tells Saijima that the cops are going to be out in full force, and he heads to the West Park bathroom so he can find Purgatory, and the florist with it. When he finds the entrance, though, he realizes it isn't used for the West Park anymore, and is a real bathroom now, and walks in on a man using it. When walking around the city, Saijima finds a construction worker who says he knows how to get into purgatory, and after promising him he won't tell anyone, he tells him it's under a manhole in the children's park. He has to defeat some thugs that are guarding the entrance, and eventually ends up in the florist's office. The florist says the information will cost him 10 million yen, but he of course takes him to the Colosseum instead. We have our annual match in the Colosseum to get information against a man named Ivan Ibramovich, the current champion. This match is special though, because it's a death match. After we win, the crowd wants blood from the legendary hitman, and they give him a sword to finish the job. お前が。お前が。殺せ殺せ言うてるけどもやな。こん中でほんまに人殺したやつがおるんかこれ。When he leaves, the florist stops him, telling him that he did the right thing, because he would have written him off if he'd done the deed. 
The florist takes Saijima back to his office and tells him that Sasai stepped down from the Yakuza and the Ueno Saiwa forced him into hiding when they put money on his head. He was brought into purgatory, barely hanging on, and has been living on the streets ever since. He's not the man Saijima remembers, and the florist brings him in to see Saijima. Sasai barely recognizes his former family member, and he embraces his boss as he cries. He thanks the florist and tells him that he plans to confront Majima next about what happened in 1985. The florist suggests he hide out for a bit because the cops are looking for him, and now is when we're forced to use the roofs and underground. The police are everywhere now, and getting caught at all is a game over. This definitely leaves something to be desired in the way of doing side content throughout the game, but fits the story and is a good choice overall, immersing us further in Saijima himself. Back at the hideout, Minami is there. He tells him that Majima wants to talk, and he needs to meet him at the Millennium Tower tomorrow night. Saijima tells him to deliver a message to Majima. He better have some good answers, or he's going to take him down. The next day, Saijima tells Kido about what happened and the kid offers to get him a good path to the Millennium Tower. Kido asks him if he regrets what he did before he leaves, and Saijima thinks he must have something big planned. He tells Kido that he regrets killing the men, but he doesn't regret following his orders and trying to help the family. He says this is what it really means to be a Yakuza, and that if he has something planned, he should go all out. We weave a ridiculous path through the city, going underground, back to street levels, across the roofs, and finally reaching the Millennium Tower. Inside, there's an army of Majima family members with Minami at their helm. We have to fight waves and waves of men, and finally, at the end, Minami himself. He's pretty much the same, just a little powered up, and seems to use his flame attack a little more liberally. He's no match for Saijima, though, and he goes down. Majima shows up himself and tells Saijima to come with him so they can speak in private. Outside, Majima has a legion of men and says that this is so they can get through the city without the police bothering them. He takes them to their old favorite place, the batting cages. Majima is trying to play ball for old time's sake, but Saijima is having none of it. He wants answers, and Majima says they have to battle it out, since they took an oath that they suffer death if they betray the other. He has to beat him to get his answers. It's honestly kind of strange to see Majima this subdued. He's normally so outlandish and brash, but here he seems solemn and ashamed. Is it because of what he did, or that he can be his true self around an old friend? We fight Majima in a pretty difficult battle. The guy is as fast as usual, and that counters a guy like Saijima pretty well. He can deliver punishing attacks and a spin move that, though it does a lot of damage, leaves him vulnerable at the end. He also puts us in a ton of QTEs, which, if failed, are punishing. When we finally take him down, Saijima says that he's weaker than he remembers, and he lost his eye. <laughs> He says he doesn't feel as tough not being able to see fully. Saijima asks him straight up if he lost his eye because of him, or if he couldn't show because he lost the eye. It's kind of sad seeing Saijima begging for these answers, begging to hear that Majima didn't betray him. He wants so badly to have his brother back. Majima tells him that the hit was a setup, but he's not 100% sure. He thinks the whole thing was set up by Shibata, and Majima means to end him. This is the end of Saijima's part. We jump back to April 21st, 1985, and we see Majima being brought to a warehouse by Shibata. He says he won't make the hit today as Dojima changed his mind and called it off. Majima wants an explanation and Shibata tells him it was originally Dojima's idea. 
He thinks that there's a traitor in the Ueno Saiwa clan and arranged the whole thing with a traitor in the Tojo. He says that the traitor has to be Sasai because he has connections to Ueno Saiwa. He tells Majima to sit tight and let Saijima take the fall because it would look bad if he didn't. Majima refuses and goes to leave, but Shibata forces him to stay, his men taking him down after a fierce battle. They chain him to a support beam and one of the thugs cuts out his eye. We jump back to the present day and see our own new protagonist, Tanimura, at the Tokyo PD HQ being interrogated by Suji Uchi. If you remember, this is the same guy that warned Akiyama in the alleyway at the beginning of the game. He's asking him about Ihara's murder and why his fingerprints were on the body. But Tanimura is listening to a horse race in his earpiece and he gets up to leave. Before he does, Tsujiuchi tells him not to stick his nose where it doesn't belong because he might end up dead like his father. He calls him a parasite for shaking down illegal businesses and Tanimura heads out. On his way out, he runs into his boss, Hisai, who is chiding him for being sighted at a mahjong parlor when he was supposed to be on patrol. He tells him that his father wouldn't like him gambling on duty if he was still alive. He says he won't anymore, and when he returns to Kamurocho, he makes it his mission to find the man that ratted on him. He heads to Orchid Palace and talks to the two regulars he was playing with the other day. They say it wasn't them that ratted, and it was probably the new guy they were playing with. They don't want to tell him his name unless he gives them a reward, two silver plates that they can pawn for some money. We can actually buy the silver plates or win enough mahjong to pay for them, but the third option, and much cheaper, is to buy two fake plates from Ibisu Pond. The newbie's name is Aida, and he's at the Shifuku parking lot doing work. Aida is a try-and-hit-me guy. These men appear in almost every Yakuza entry as sub-stories that you can take on. You have to hit them in a certain time period, and they can usually dodge like crazy. He ends up confessing to ratting on Tanimura, and Tanimura has to hit him for his transgressions. He says that he's sorry and explains himself. Every year, a guy in a scary white suit, Kiryu, shows up and beats him, which is true. He says he wanted to take up another hobby to stop thinking about it, and he found Mahjong. He was good at first, but then he met Tanimura, who was an exceptional player, and it demoralized him, so he wanted to get back at him. Tanimura tells him not to do it again, and he gets a call about a fight at Theater Square. He finds a thug shaking down a businessman who has to beat up the man to get him to leave. He gets a call from his friend Zhao, who wants his help resolving something at Homeland. This is the name of Zhao's restaurant, and it's located in Little Asia. This is another completely new area that was added for the entry, and is only accessible by Tanimura. Little Asia is a safe Asian for Chinese immigrants and people of nationalities other than Japanese. Tanimura can speak many languages, hence his ability to get inside. Tanimura heads there, and on the way, a hostess doorman gives him cash to cover up the fact that he's employing illegal immigrants. He's basically extorting the guy so he doesn't out him for the crimes he's committing. He tells him to keep an eye out for a woman that the police are chasing, and he hands him a picture of Lily. When Tanimura gets to Homeland, Zhao is on a phone call and he says a girl whose father has been deported will be joining them soon. He gives him the money from the doorman to cover expenses, and Zhao takes the money even though he doesn't agree with how he retrieved it. Tanimura was late because the police have been busy with the recent shooting. He wants to keep a close eye because it involves the Ueno Saiwa, who his father was investigating before he was murdered. He thinks they may be connected because the Ueno Saiwa have been relatively quiet for 25 years, so something big must be coming. He says he has to find the woman in the picture, who is fully revealed to be Yasuko Saijima, Taiga Saijima's sister. The last thing written in his father's notebook was to meet with her. Tanimura gets a call from Park, who runs the club Midori. Park says that a customer came in that looks like Yasuko. He meets with the manager outside, and he asks if they could skip next month's inspection because there are new workers from Korea who don't have their papers. Tanimura tells him to start paying them a living wage, and Yasuko arrives outside. He says he needs to ask her some questions about the shooting, but she doesn't know anything. At that moment, Shibata goons arrive to take her away, and Tanimura has to take them down. So, before we get into things, let's talk about Tanimura's combat. Tanimura is a little strange when it comes to combat. His abilities are completely reflective of his character, and I'll give the team that. 
The first noticeable difference is that he has less health than the others. This makes him susceptible to damage, but to mitigate this low health, he can parry. This can be activated by using the block button, causing Akiyama to glow. When attacked in this state, he will brush off the advance and push the enemy behind him, opening them up for an attack or heat action. This seems pretty useful in the beginning, but actually pulling it off in combat felt like something that wasn't very reliable, and when faced with a lot of enemies at once, which Tanimura will be, it just doesn't work out. I would have to say overall that Tanimura was my least favorite fighter, even though his style seems the most interesting. When he turns around, Yasuko is gone, and he asks the Shibata men where she's gone. They say she probably went to the docks, so that's where Tanimura heads. There, he finds tons of men guarding the place and has to fight his way through waves and waves of enemies. There's one ridiculous section here where oil is spilled all over the ground. If we step in the oil at all, we slip, fall, and take damage. I call this part the oil section, and I fucking hate the oil section. Tanimura finds a warehouse and two Yakuza members, Sakakibara and Hiragi, are out front. This fight was a bit of a challenge just because Tanimura's health is so low, and I did not come prepared with healing items. It does have one of the coolest counter attacks at the end, though. Tanimura finds a warehouse, and inside, he hears Shibata tell Arai to lay low for a while. He says that Daigo won't suspect a thing, and Shibata didn't actually cut his finger off. He just wanted to get the Ueno off his trail. He plans to meet Katsuragi, the Ueno Saiwa captain, tomorrow at Cafe Alps. Arai thinks it isn't smart to be going out in public, but Shibata thinks they have bigger things to deal with. We see Yasuko is tied up on the couch, and Shibata asks her why she is targeting his men. She says she didn't think she could get the 100 million, and Arai offers to kill her and get rid of the problem. Shibata wants to find out what motivated her though, and maybe some other ooh stuff. At this point, Arai turns on Shibata and shoots him, telling him that he's always been allied with Katsuragi, and he knows they set up the hit in 1985. The two don't need him anymore, and Tanimura bursts in while Arai runs away. Tanimura tries to get answers out of Shibata before he dies, but he goes too soon. Tanimura and Yasuko head back to Homeland. He says she'll be safe there, and she asks him if he heard what Shibata said. Tanimura can't do much because his jurisdiction isn't murder. Yasuko is now technically in protective custody, because he's keeping her from the Yakuza that are chasing her. He tells Yasuko the reason he's helping her is because his father was supposed to meet her. Thus, he isn't a cop questioning a suspect, but a son looking into his father's murder. It's much more personal. Yasuko says she never met his father. He was supposed to meet her in Kamurocho, but rescheduled and told her that he knew the hit was planned and that someone else was pulling the strings. She ended up leaving Kamurocho after he rescheduled and didn't dig deeper. Tanimura thinks that maybe a third party killed him because he had information he wasn't supposed to have. Yasuko says she only came back because Katsuragi contacted her and that he would free Saijima for either 100 million yen or killing people for him. He said he was a victim of the 1985 shooting and his testimony would free Saijima. She thinks that Katsuragi wanted to silence anyone who knew about what happened during the hit. Tanimura says that with her information, he thinks Katsuragi and Shibata were partners in 1985, but Shibata was blackmailing him, so he sent Arai to end it. They can't get any more information but from the man himself, and Tanimura plans to lure him out with Yasuko. Yasuko doesn't want to help because she thinks Katsuragi can still free Saijima, but Tanimura doesn't think he will. He says he'll prove Saijima's innocence if he can figure out who killed his father first. She finally agrees very reluctantly, thinking that Tanimura is selfishly using her brother's freedom as a way to get what he wants. Yasuko says she's leaving for Okinawa to see her brother in prison one last time before he's executed, and hands Tanimura the keys to a car that has the 100 million yen inside, to keep safe while she's gone. When Tanimura gets the money, he gets a call from someone who says there's an informant waiting for him who can give him the answers he needs. When he meets up with the informant, he receives a bouquet with a note saying he'll get a call from Katsuragi. 
Tanimura tells Katsuragi that he has Yasuko and that he demands that he tell him everything about the hit and his father's death. He wants Tanimura to provide the 100 million as proof of Yasuko, and the two agree to meet at the Millennium Tower at 5 the next day. Tanimura returns to Homeland to rest, and the next day he heads to the tower. Katsuragi appears from the crowd, and the two have a conversation walking around Kamurocho. Apparently, his father was not killed because of the Ueno Saiwa hit, but because of corruption in the Tokyo PD. Saijima didn't kill anyone that day, but someone else came along and finished the job, and it was covered up. Katsuragi won't tell him who it was or who killed his father until he tells him where Yasuko is. Tanimura gives him the money and says she's already gone so he can forget about her, as a small army of men show up on the streets. Katsuragi takes his leave and tells Tanimura that he was the one that finished off the Ueno Saiwa men and that he can't recall who killed his father, but his men are on their way to homeland. Sugiuchi shows up and saves Tanimura and he tells him to go back to homeland while they make arrests. We have to make our way back with the briefcase, using it as a weapon in the multiple fights that we have in the streets. At one point, someone grabs the briefcase and runs, and we have to get it back. When Tanimura arrives back at Homeland, Hisai, his boss, is waiting for him. Hisai says he's been watching Tanimura after he learned he was going to contact the Ueno Saiwa, trying to make sure he was staying out of trouble. Tanimura fills him and Zhao in on the information that Saijima is innocent of murder, but he still can't figure out why they pinned it on him. Hisai says they should head to the archive room in Tokyo PD, the Scandal Graveyard. Tanimura finds a file on the hit. It was assigned to two detectives, Tanimura's father and Junji Sugiuchi. Tanimura heads back to Homeland and is going to take the money to Sky Finance. Two of our new protagonists meet again. Tanimura explains what happened and who Lily actually is. Tanimura tries to return the money, but Akiyama doesn't want it back. Plus, the money is his only connection to Lily, and he can't let that go. Akiyama gets a call from Kido, telling him that Mishima, the man that was with Ihara the first night, is offering information to the police for his protection. Tanimura and Akiyama get the story straight, and combine their information to figure out what's going on. Basically, Ihara was murdered as a way for Katsuragi and Shibata to take over the Tojo. But Katsuragi had no use for Shibata, so he ousted him. Katsuragi brought in Yasuko to have her start dispensing people who knew about the hit, and Katsuragi probably got panicked when his handlers wanted to cover things up. Tanimura is going to meet with Mishima to lure out the traitor that he thinks is present. He heads to the docks and promises to protect him for information. Mishima says they were ordered by Katsuragi to start trouble at the club, and he found Ihara's body later after they ran. When he returned to the HQ, he overheard Katsuragi talking about having Ihara killed, and Mishima was next, so he ran. Just then, Mishima is shot, and Tsujiuchi comes from the shadows. He was the traitor all along and helped Katsuragi cover up the hit all those years ago. Tons of cops come out of the woodwork, led by Sudo himself. Tsujiuchi begins to flee, and we have to chase him, eventually into boats. And then we have a chase sequence on boats, which is absolutely nuts. We can ram our boat into his and get his boat's stamina meter down. It works the same way a normal chase does, but eventually Tanimura catches up to him and wounds him. We have our final boss battle of Tanimura's part, which is pretty simple overall, nothing too complex here. Tsukiyuchi eventually admits to killing Tanimura's father, and he wants to know why an honest cop would do that. He says he isn't an honest cop, but a Yakuza. Tsukiyuchi was originally a spy on the force, and the truth behind the hit is that Saijima had guns loaded with rubber bullets. He didn't kill anyone. Katsuragi came in afterwards and finished the job with real bullets. Sugiuchi came in and shot Katsuragi to end things and finish his cover-up story, but his superior saw through it. Munakata realized that none of it made any sense, that a man couldn't go up against 20 others and get clean headshots every time. Munakata blackmailed him and introduced him to Katsuragi, who became his sworn brother. Tanimura realizes that the corruption goes up way too high for him to do anything alone. Just when he's about to get his final answers, Sugiuchi is shot by a gunman in a boat. 
As he dies, he warns him that there's another traitor on the force. Munakata gets a call from Hisai telling him that Tsujiuchi has died. He tells Hisai to deal with Tanimura's family, and he has Zhao and his daughter tied up, a gunshot ringing out as the scene cuts away. That's the end for our new protagonist's parts, and we finally get to switch back to an old familiar face, Kazuma Kiryu. Kiryu is at morning glory as Hamazaki, half alive, stumbles into the place. Kiryu assists him and helps him recover from his wounds. Kiryu lets Hamazaki know that Saijima made it out alive, and Hamazaki is happy to hear it. He tells Kiryu that they're brothers, and he begs him for his help. Hamazaki said he chose Saijima because he knew the truth about the hit, but he didn't get to tell him everything before things went south. He wants Kiryu to tell him what really happened that day, as it could save Majima's life. Hamazaki shows Kiryu the proof he stole from the warden's office, revealing that the penitentiary is financed by none other than the Tojo clan. It all started with Jingu, the antagonist from the first game in the series. The 10 billion yen in that game was meant to fund the penitentiary. The police force was hoping to use it to dump Yakuza and then use them to commit crimes they could easily solve, allowing corrupt members of the force to rise higher. Hamazaki tells Kiryu that this is way above his head, but he wants to know why Hamazaki is really involved. Hamazaki shows him that the real plan is to destroy the Tojo clan and replace them with the Ueno Saiwa by giving them Kamurocho Hills. We see at this point that Haruka has been listening in to the whole conversation. The next day, all of the kids return from the trip they were on and Haruka tells them to stay away from Hamazaki. Haruka is furious that Kiryu is trusting him after what he did, and she says she'll never trust him again. He goes to the beach to talk to her, and she's worried that he's going to die if he goes back to Kamurocho. Hamazaki comes to the beach and says he'll go alone. He doesn't want Kiryu to get involved after all, and it's not worth risking his life over. Kiryu walks Hamazaki to the police station to turn himself in, and when they arrive, they see Yasuko arguing with the police about the existence of Okinawa Penitentiary No. 2. Kiryu and Hamazaki talk to her, and she says she's trying to see Saijima. They take her to the old Tamashiro offices so they can tell her what's going on, and they update her about everything. Yasuko needs to get back to Kamurocho, and Kiryu wants to take her there. Just then, the guards from the prison arrive, Saito himself leading them. They don't just want Hamazaki, though, they want Yasuko, too. We have to fight our way through them and eventually get our first boss battle with Saito. Kiryu's combat style is very similar to his combat in Yakuza 3. He has most of the same moves and abilities, and it's generally not that much of a change. He's kind of the all-rounder out of the four, but when we first get him, he's a little weak, as usual, and it takes a while for him to truly be able to unleash some fury. Getting Komaki Perry and Tiger Drop is kind of essential to him in this game, as without it, he's in the dark. Saito is kind of ridiculous as a boss first up. He stun locks us like crazy, and if you're backed up against a wall, he can get tons of hits in before we can do anything to mitigate it. When it's over, Hamazaki hands Yasuko off and tells them to go to Kamurocho. They leave and Hamazaki collapses from wounds to the back that we couldn't see, showing that he may have truly turned over a new leaf. We see Tanimura in Homeland praying over Hisai and Sugiuchi's badges. Tanimura sympathizes with the two men to Zhao and reveals that Hisai took his own life after not being able to kill Zhao and his daughter, and Sugiuchi came clean about the 1985 hit. Tanimura's new mission is to take down Munakata, but he needs the help of his new ally, Akiyama. Sky Finance is being torn up by the DA's office, saying that he coerces his clients into loans. Tanimura says he has something Akiyama needs to help him with. We see Kiryu and Yasuko arriving in Kamurocho. They need to find Saijima, but Kiryu wants to talk to Yasuko first, so they head to New Sedena. When they arrive, they find Date taking care of the bar while Mariko is out of town. He asks Yasuko why she wants to see Saijima so bad that she would kill for it. She reveals that when she was younger, she needed a kidney transplant and Saijima wasn't a match. 
The two aren't blood related, only step siblings. He tracked down her biological father to donate her a kidney, but he wanted 30 million for it because he was a hitman for the Omi Alliance and the money wasn't coming in anymore. So Sai stepped in and offered to pay as long as Saijima joined his family. Saijima has always looked out for Yasuko and for that, she owes him her life. He tells Yasuko to stay there while he looks for Saijima. If he's the only reason that she's living, if they find him dead, it would be a major blow to her, and he isn't sure what she would do. He asks Date to watch over her, and he heads out into the streets. Date chases him out, and there's some things he wants to tell him away from Yasuko. He tells Kiryu that Majima and Saijima have already met, and he tells him to head to the Millennium Tower so he can find Majima. When he gets there, he sees the Mad Dog being arrested. He says he got trapped, and the one who ratted on him was Daigo. Everything is connected, the 10 billion yen, Jingu, Yasuko, and the hit from 1985. He tells Kiryu he needs to do something quick, or it'll mean the end of the Tojo clan. We see Daigo talking to Munakata, who is letting Daigo know they brought Majima in. Munakata is trying to convince Daigo to work with them. He wants them to work together to bring it back to the way it was after World War II, the police keeping the peace, and the Yakuza destroying foreign threats. All he needs to do is promote Arai to clan captain and have him act as a bridge between the police and the Tojo, and Munakata will take out the Ueno Saiwa. In Purgatory, Saijima is captured by Katsuragi. He reveals the truth, that Saijima was framed and he really did the deed in 1985. He needs Saijima and Yasuko, the file that Hamazaki stole and the money from Sky Finance. He doesn't need Munakata anymore, and then his new partner is revealed, Kido. Kiryu is making his way to New Sedena to find Yasuko, and she's gone. Date is knocked out. He thinks Yasuko drugged him after he left, and Kiryu finds her walking the streets with Tanimura and Akiyama, but he hasn't met them yet. He follows them into the underground sewers, and they hear him behind them. They think he's some Ueno thug, and we battle the two. They're both pretty strong, and they block a lot. Tanimura can parry us, and Akiyama is fast. Taking them down isn't too difficult if they can be kept separate. We get a pretty cool finisher move at the end of the fight, though. Kiryu chases down Yasuko and finds the florist and his men destroyed. Akiyama and Tanimura arrive just after, and he tells the three that Katsuragi and Kido took Yasuko. Date is helping Tanimura recover in New Sedena, while Kiryu and Akiyama are going to check Sky Finance. They took all 100 billion of Akiyama's money. Kido found the entrance to his vault by accident a few days later. Kido must have faked his kidnapping, and Akiyama isn't too sour about losing his money because he's confident he'll get it back. He's also happy he got to meet Kiryu, who sort of brought him back from the streets indirectly. The group need to get Yasuko back, and Kiryu says they need to use the ledger Hamazaki found as leverage. He calls Katsuragi on Tanimura's phone and offers a trade, the file for Saijima and Yasuko. He tells Kiryu he'll have to take on the entire Ueno Saiwa on his way to Kamurocho Hills, and Kiryu agrees. Everyone else thinks it's a bad idea, but Kiryu cannot be convinced, so he heads out. We head to Kamurocho Hills, and we get one of the most frustrating combat sequences ever. So this is pretty near to the end of the game, so this segment is quite long, which is totally fine. I don't mind rampaging through enemies for a half hour, no big deal. But there are some enemies in here that are just insane to fight. There are three mini-bosses we fight on our way up. First up is a man wielding a sledgehammer outside of the building. It's not that bad, we can just dodge his attacks and get behind him. Second is the baton guy, and coupled with his cronies, he's incredibly annoying. He stuns us to no end, he's hard to hit, and it's difficult to get out of the way once he starts hitting. Once he's down, further up the building is him again. It's just as annoying as the last time, but just again. A little further up the tower is a mini-boss who wields a shotgun. He can fire off shots incredibly fast, and he's hard to get at with three other guys covering us. When we get hit by him, we're downed immediately. Most of the time when we hit him, he dodges and fires off a shot right away. Another super annoying fight. But when we finally get to the top, we have to fight all of the mini-bosses again all at once, and with the addition of a new one who uses crazy fast kicks to down us all the time. 
This fight was just dumb. It was so much all at once. There's way too many ways to get stun locked, and you're just constantly fighting to stay on your feet, let alone deliver offensive blows. They were pretty annoying, but they're nothing compared to two of the bosses that we're about to face. When Kiryu arrives at the top of the tower, Yasuko and Saijima are there, captured. Kiryu shows him the file and tells him to let the two go. Kido arrives with the cash, and he frees Yasuko. Once Kiryu gives the file to Katsuragi, he'll free Saijima after he's confirmed it's authentic. Kido pulls a gun and is about to shoot Kiryu and Yasuko, the two misplacing their trust in these shady men. Kido turns on Katsuragi then and shoots him, revealing Arai was there the whole time. Then Arai double crosses Kido and shoots him in the stomach. Kido is lowered down the elevator with the cash and Arai introduces himself to Kiryu. Arai promises that Kiryu cannot stop the dissolution of the Tojo clan because it's already begun. He leaves and Yasuko frees Saijima. He jumps on Katsuragi, revealing that he's alive, wearing a bulletproof vest. Katsuragi taunts Saijima, and he decides not to kill him as it isn't worth it. Before she dies, she walks over and shoots Katsuragi. Saijima gets one last fateful goodbye as Yasuko dies in his arms. This is the end of Kiryu's part, but there's still much more left to be told as far as this story goes. There are four chapters in each part. Each character gets their own little slice of story in this entry, but the last chapter, the finale, Requiem, involves all of them. We see Arai giving the file to Munakata, and he isn't happy because he let the money slip through his hands. He should have collected the money and finished off Kido, but he let Kiryu have it. Now he wants Arai to go to Okinawa and kidnap the kids so they can get the money from Kiryu. Arai takes the gun Munakata offers him and uses it to shoot him. He's not going to be taking orders from him anymore. I have to say, a lot of these nefarious bad guys would have a lot more success in these games if they just worked together. A lot of their downfall is from the inside, not the outside. I mean, just in the last five minutes, they've killed each other, all without our heroes even having to do anything. Kiryu and Tanimura are back at New Sedena, Saijima and Akiyama mourning Yasuko's death. Haruka calls to tell Kiryu that Hamazaki is dead and she regrets saying bad things about him before he died. She tells him that his last wish was for Kiryu and Saijima to protect the Tojo clan from the police. Kiryu tells Saijima what happened to Hamazaki and he tells him about their mission. Not just as Saijima and Kiryu, but as powerful members of the Yakuza. It always seems like there's another problem, another person to be dealt with, but that's just how life is, and they have to see this through. Not for themselves or their personal vendettas, not for gain or money or power, but for all of the people that are counting on them. That is their burden. Akiyama and Tanimura agree, and the four begin planning their strategy. They decide that the best course of action is to take all of the 100 billion yen up to the Millennium Tower and wait for the wolves to strike. They're not sure who is really pulling the strings, so they figure that they'll invite all of their enemies and let them claw at each other. Once they realize who is really behind it all, the four of them can defeat the man. They have a small funeral for Yasko on the roof of New Sedena, a tearful goodbye to the woman that is really gut-wrenching. They head to the tower and Daigo, Kido, and Arai all arrive. Daigo has been giving Kido orders all along. Arai asks Daigo why he betrayed the Tojo, and he says it's because the Tojo isn't what it used to be. There are no heroes like Kiryu to keep the clan from falling apart. And without money and power, he couldn't support the clan himself. Arai reveals he's been an undercover cop this whole time, but it doesn't matter now, and he wants to seize the Tojo clan for himself. 
A wrench is pretty quickly thrown in this plan as Munakata arrives, not dead at all. His special forces are going to arrest Daigo and Arai. He shoots Arai in the gut and tells him it was a rubber bullet in his gun and the one Arai used to shoot him. A helicopter arrives and the money is spread all over the place, the wind from the propellers taking it all over Kamurocho. Akiyama, Tanimura, Saijima, and Kiryu all step out, each taking a man to battle. In this finale, we get to play all four characters, each taking down one boss on their own. It's a fantastic setup and just works so well to tie this whole game together. Bringing all four protagonists to the end, each of them getting their own due in its finale. Before we get to each of these fights though, and the final end of the game, we should talk about the music. I know I usually talk about this much earlier in the videos, but I wanted to wait to put it here as this is really where Yakuza 4's music comes to a head. Each character has their own battle track for this ending, all remixed versions of the same track that fit their individual styles. Akiyama's track, Four Face, is groovy, laid back, guitars at the forefront, instruments behind, supporting the thing and propping it up. This reflects Akiyama's stripped-back nature, his honesty and probably his naivete, but also his lackadaisical attitude. For Faith, Saijima's track is a much harder version of the song. The guitar's gritty, hearing the growl of the strings begets the growl of the tiger himself. The drums in the background are much harder and the synths are heavy. Four Face is Kiryu's version of the track and is way more somber than any other. It's mostly backed by pianos and cymbals, slow and melancholic. This is reflective of his overall journey, the things he's lost along the way, and the burden that he still carries for everyone else. It also shows what it's like to face the sixth chairman in battle, a betrayal that strikes deep at his own heart. For Faith, Tani Mora's track is the most triumphant of them all. His battle is personal, his father's death on the hands of the man in front of him. It's much more of a ballad than anything and really feels like overcoming adversity, overcoming odds and achieving it all in the end. <laughs> Akiyama's confrontation with Arai begins with Akiyama expressing his disappointment in the man. He trusted him and put his respect behind him. Now he has to stop him at all costs. Arai has quite a bit of health, but he's not too bad of a fight. Akiyama's crazy leg combos can get through most of his blocking, so it isn't too bad. Saijima confronts Kido next, the kid he told to go all out, and he's going to do the same for him now. Kido really isn't too bad at all, and like I said before, Saijima is pretty strong when he's fully leveled. Timing the charge up attacks to not get knocked down is paramount here, and getting in a big combo will destroy Kido's health quick. Then we have Kiryu and Daigo. Kiryu apologizes for leaving Daigo out to dry, as he didn't know it would come to this if he wasn't around. He tells Kiryu he would return the clan to him if he could, but his reputation is on the line and that just isn't possible now. This is the point where Daigo kind of let me down. I didn't think he would let himself become corrupted, but he did and turned on everyone that had faith in him, especially Kiryu. Regardless, the two have to duke it out and we see Daigo's tattoo, the immovable Buddha. Now, this is where the fights start to get hairy. Daigo is a awful opponent, and I have to concede that he probably should be, he's the sixth chairman, but boy is he annoying to fight. 
it is damn near impossible to get a full combo off on him because he blocks every attack volleyed at him. We're relegated to delivering short, quick blows and getting out of the way, which drags the fight on very long. We can't even really get behind him unless he's already attacking, and if we manage to, he recovers so quickly that you can't get more than one or two hits in at a time. If you get greedy at all and miss an attack or go too far, he will absolutely punish you for it, delivering ridiculous combos and stuns that you just can't get out of. It'll come at the cost of a quarter of your health bar. It's insane and was just not an enjoyable fight at all. And when I beat him, I had a sliver of health left. The last fight of the four is Tanimura versus Munakata. Tanimura tells him that he quits and he's handing in his badge. Munakata brings his special forces in and says he'll kill Tanimura. Tanimura explains that he doesn't understand how Kamurocho works. Men like Akiyama, Saijima, and Kiryu can take down entire clans with their determination, and Tanimura is going to remind him of this fact. Yakuza 4 has quite a few annoying fights on its roster, but none rival this fight. This is easily the worst fight in the game, and I think its design kind of makes sense, and I feel the need to give it that credit before I talk bad about it. Munakata runs around the helipad and shoots at us from afar, while he lets his men do the dirty work. This is reflective of his character, so it's definitely fitting with that, but as a gameplay element, it's awful. He runs away from us the entire time, and his soldiers won't attack, only dodge until we hit him. Once we hit him, they go berserk. Eight dudes just randomly slashing at you over and over again until you eventually fall. It's awful and is just the most frustrating thing in this game. I understand the design and what they were going for, but it really just sours the final battle for me. The cherry on top is that we're playing as Tanimura, so we have lower health and we have to use parry as our main recourse. This works alright for the first couple attacks when a crowd is swarming us, but eventually you miss one and you're downed by the entire group. It's just insane and doesn't really make me feel triumphant, just frustrated. Tanimura takes down Munakata and he tries to crawl away. He wants to get Daigo to help him, but he tells Munakata to surrender. Tanimura shoots beside Munakata, but doesn't deliver the killing blow. He uses some restraint. Arai shows up and says Munakata will rot in the prison he made, and he'll be there alongside him. He's thankful that they've shown him how corrupt the system is, and is happy to give the torch to Tanimura. Munakata doesn't think the charges will stick, and tells them that their plan is foiled. Sudo and Date arrive and toss papers out of the helicopter, revealing that they already gave the file to the press. Tomorrow's newspapers have his scandals printed all over them. Munakata grabs the gun on the ground and shoots Akiyama, and Tanimura puts him in cuffs. Akiyama is saved by a stack of money in his pocket, and Munakata grabs the gun and takes his own life. Two weeks later, Akiyama is sleeping on the couch when Hana arrives asking for her job back, having lost weight. They resume their bickering, and Kiryu and Date are talking on the roof. Date is joining the police force again, and Tanimura calls to Kiryu that they're late. They meet Saijima at the Tojo HQ, and they head inside to meet Daigo and Majima to officialize Saijima's return to the clan, and the forming of his own group, the Saijima family. Yakuza 4's story is an incredibly ambitious one. The team seeked to tell four interesting stories and tie them all together. They had their work cut out for them, having to create three brand new interesting characters and envelop them in the world of the Yakuza, while also making their battle systems interesting and unique. It's incredibly well done for the most part though, and works on so many levels. The multiple protagonists motif is one that Yakuza would go back to more than once and would revolutionize on the formula again and again. When we finish the game, we unlock Premium Adventure so that we can run around Kamurocho and explore all that the city has to offer. With that being said, it's about time that we talk about Yakuza 4's distractions. Yakuza 4 has its amazing main story, that much is true, but it also has some really interesting and special side content. There are tons of things to get caught up in throughout the city, and each character has their own unique activities to take part in. I'd like to go over the bigger mini-games first before we get into everything else though. 
The first mini game that returns in this entry is the Hostess Maker. This newer system was introduced in Yakuza 3 and saw Kiryu bringing up multiple hostesses to reach rank 1 at a club in Okinawa. This time, we're in Akiyama's shoes, as he has to get more girls for Club Elise and raise them through the ranks. It works very similar to the first iteration. I talked about it in depth in the last video, so I'm only going to briefly touch upon some of the features here, as much of it hasn't changed. We have to run shifts with our hostess, where we can change their outfits and train them during breaks. Training will increase their stats and their outfits will affect their style, appealing to different groups of customers. The biggest difference that I noticed in this version was the effect that outfits had on the customers. It was pretty possible to create an all-rounder outfit for Yakuza 3 and just use that to cater to all types of requests. That's not as possible in this entry though, and you have to create outfits that really cater to each group. This means we're also forced to change out outfits mid-shift as the crowd changes their interests. This game overall, though, has similar problems to its previous entry. It's not that tight and takes too long to grind out levels and unlock training mechanics and outfits. It just drags over time, and I would much rather be playing the modern Cabaret Club minigames. The hostesses themselves also make a return in this entry, allowing each individual character to visit different hostesses in multiple clubs across Kamurocho, except for Saijima, of course. These girls can be visited and we can chat with them, just like in Yakuza 3. We develop a relationship with them over time and increase their hostess meter. We can also take them out on dates to different events, and eventually we will complete their sub-story by helping them out with some issue. In the case of Ryo, it's a creepy photographer who wants to take advantage. The third larger minigame, and my favorite in this entry, and probably one of my favorites in the entire series, is the Fighter Maker. This is a Saijima-specific minigame. Throughout his story, he'll eventually meet Sodachi, a man who runs a dojo training fighters for the Colosseum. He doesn't know how to fight, though, and can't train very well. He asks Saijima to come on and help train his new recruit, Hide. Through this system, we train fighters and get them ready to compete in the Beginner's Coliseum Tournament. Each day, we can create a training regimen for them to abide by. We have multiple choices for their normal training. Punch training, kick training, groundwork, road work, strength training, dash, stretches, rest. Each of these will increase some stat on the fighter, their power, speed, technique, current stamina, max stamina, mood, or trust with Saijima. We also have special events at the end of every day that we can choose. Sparring will let us fight the trainee and can increase all of their stats. We can train them in a finishing move to give them a better repertoire in combat. We can have them solo train, which can increase all of their stats and teach them a skill if they have a high mood. We can let them rest a full day to recover. We can have meetings with them to increase their mood and trust with Saijima and send them out to do a single battle or compete in the tournament. They have to win the tournament in 50 days. Each time we win a single battle, their stats increase, and we get some money to upgrade the dojo. It's an incredibly unique and in-depth system that I just loved experimenting with and getting the hang of. The trust mechanic is also really interesting. Whenever we get into an actual battle, we don't control the fighter at all. It's automated, but we can have them use a finishing move on an opponent to take a bit of health off. This is easier to pull off if trust with Saijima is high, and it also decreases trust every time we use it. This is because the fighter wants to know that his trainer trusts him to win the match on his own without taking orders, so there's a give and take here. Eventually, training them all the way through and having them win the tournament will see the end of their arc. In Hide's case, he was training to get the girl he loved, but she ends up with someone else. He realized that he can get someone better, and training is about dedication and self-betterment. Something we can do all over Kamurocho this time is collect trash. Throughout cans and dumpsters all over the city, we can grab little pieces of trash and take it down into the sewers to have it appraised. This earns us eco points, which we can use to trade for items or even food. But of course, there's all sorts of ways to get stronger in any Yakuza game, and Yakuza 4 is not short of any sort of training. Each character has their own specific training sensei, who gives them challenges that, when completed, will earn them new abilities. In the case of Saijima, he is literally named Master. 
During this story, one of Master's disciples says he needs help. We save him from a pack of thugs who thinks he's digging for buried treasure, and the Master tells us he's really digging to uncover Kamurocho's secrets and something to do with his father, I think. Saijima can help him by using his pickaxe to dig further in and eventually find some old air raid shelters. Sometimes we'll have to protect him from falling rocks or goons that want to attack him. Each of these that are completed will earn us a new ability or increase damage. Akiyama's training master is Saigo, an ex-military guy we meet on the roofs of Kamurocho. He'll train us in running, shooting, and fighting. Each of his tasks have us doing just that, and there are ultra-difficult versions of each of those challenges that will give us even better skill upgrades. Kiryu's training master is, of course, Komaki, who still has his dojo in the Dragon Palace. This training is really easy and short, though, and just consists of us fighting Komaki's incredibly weak pupils to gain some upgrades, and Komaki yelling at us about forgetting books at the dojo. Tanimura's training master is Nair, or Nair? I'm gonna call her Nair, a Filipino police officer that only speaks Tagalog. Luckily, Tanimura is fluent in most Asian languages. She wants to help us get stronger, and her training is just dumb. She's ridiculously powerful and can do that same parrying that Tanimura does, except that she does it all the time, and landing a hit on her is super hard. I resorted to just repeatedly parrying her into the corner until she was down. There's always a way. There is some training that can be used by all characters, though, like Revelations, which were introduced in Yakuza 3 and make a return in this entry. Revelations are situations that the characters can observe and gain inspiration from. These situations are usually pretty unique and wacky, but the characters will then blog about them and report their findings. Saijima doesn't have a phone or a camera, though, so he has to carve his inspirations into wood, which I thought was hilarious. By far the most extensive and probably important training in this entry is the IF-7R, the upgraded version of Mina Mida's virtual reality game. This game sees us fighting previous bosses that we've defeated and our heat bar acts as our health for the battle. We also can't use heat actions and the bosses usually have some interesting modifiers to them. We can input enemy information from any character, allowing each character to fight the other if they'd like. These will give us upgrades to our heat bar's decrease time and also the heat bar itself. We've got to use this training somehow, though, and there's no better way than in the Colosseum itself. This is only available to Kiryu and Saijima, but they can both have pretty prolific careers in the ring. The Colosseum is mostly the same as the previous versions, but the big difference is we're allowed to take part in any tournament straight from the get-go, which is a huge upgrade in my opinion. Tanimura has his own specific challenges that he can take part in. He can help a local group of vigilantes called the Kamurocho Guard. Using his police scanner headset, he can track down in-progress crimes and thwart them to help the group out. There's not a lot of reward for doing this other than completionist reasons, though. When Kiryu is wandering the city, certain random encounter fights will be led by one specific group, one of the seven gangs that are troubling the city. Once he dispenses with a few of them, they'll tell him where their leader is, and he'll have to track them down. Each time he does, he'll get a reward for doing so. This one actually can be lucrative, the highest reward going up to 200,000 yen. The Aroma Massage has also made a return with two new massages, but it functions basically the same. Keep the cursor up to score points. There are all of the regular minigames at play here that we're used to seeing. Baccarat, Blackjack, Silo, Chohan, Koi Koi, Oicho Kabu, Poker, Roulette, Batting, Bowling, Boxelios, and Boxelios 2, Darts, Fishing, Golf, Karaoke, Mahjong, Shogi, with some new additions in that of Table Tennis and Pachinko. I had absolutely no idea what was going on during the Pachinko minigame, but I just kept the balls rolling and watched the pretty colors. But of course, the meat of the Yakuza side content is always the sub-stories. These are side quests, usually self-contained short stories that are outlandish and wacky adventures for our characters to go on. Again, I'm only going to be talking about a few here because talking about all of them would take up quite a bit of time. 
The first one I want to talk about is a continuation of the story from the previous games. In the first Yakuza, Takashi, the florist's son who he has abandoned, is with a girl whose father is a Yakuza. The two realize their love for their children from afar and leave them to be together. In Yakuza 2, Kiryu meets him again and sees him with another woman. Takashi reveals that Kiyoka is cheating on him and he wants to meet the florist to get information on who she's with, not knowing the florist is his father. He finds out that she's not cheating on him, but getting money from her father to support the two. In Yakuza 4, we see him at the Millennium Tower, and he's straightened up his life and feels like he's ready to meet his real father. So he wants to go to the florist again and get the information he seeks. The florist says he'll do it, but he wants Takashi to work for him for a bit as an informant. He has Takashi go around to different places in the city to get information. At each place, he's hired one of the other protagonists, Tanimura, Akiyama, and Saijima to try and entice him with bribes, hostesses, or backing down from a fight. He passes all the tests and he gives Takashi a bouquet with a letter that says his father is dead. The flowers in the bouquet are ones that his mother loved and have been placed at his mother's grave every day since she died. Takashi finds solace in the fact that at least he knows the truth now and invites Kiryu to his wedding. An interesting follow-up story is triggered when we're walking along the streets of Kamurocho and see Kanto, one of the hitmen we captured for the HLA in Yakuza 3. He was previously working as a hitman, but is now in the care of Ibuki at the Honest Living Association, an organization set up by Kashiwagi before he died, designed to help Yakuza get back on their feet. Kanto is kind of a leech though, he keeps losing his jobs and doesn't really do anything, just mooching off of Ibuki's freebies. Kiryu helps him out and he gets a job at a shop nearby. He quickly loses it after getting into a fight with some customers, so Kiryu gives him some advice. After this, he gets a job at Sushi Jin and gets into another fight with some customers. This time though, the manager keeps him on because he protected the place and got rid of the thugs that were plaguing the restaurant. The substory Return of Fake Kiryu happens when Kiryu reunites with Yuya from Stardust. He tells him that someone is impersonating him online and he can't stand for this. He tracks the guy all over the city using his posts as clues to where he's at. Eventually he stands up to the man and fights him. He agrees to back off and makes a post online telling everyone that he was a fraud and he's sorry. The final substory I want to talk about is a really interesting one and gets particularly emotional. Kiryu sits down at Bantam for a drink, but one of the seats is reserved. He takes the seat next to it and a woman bursts in, apparently recognizing Kiryu. She thinks he is her boyfriend and he abandoned her in the city a year ago, never returning. She takes him to various places around the city to jog his memory, but he doesn't even know who she is. The manager at the bowling alley says he looks a spitting image to her previous boyfriend, but he's been gone for so long and she won't face it. She takes us to the business that her and her ex opened and some thugs try to beat her up and get her to pay the debt she owes, but Kiryu defends her. She has a voice message on her machine and it's from Yusaku, her boyfriend. He reveals that he had cancer and it spread too quickly. There was nothing he could do. He wanted to tell her over the phone because he knew that she wouldn't face it if he told her in person. He left a slip in the desk for her to pick something up at La Marche. She still doesn't believe it, thinking Kiryu to be Yusuku, and it's just another one of his lies. The two head to La Marche and pick up the package, a pair of engagement rings he got for them before he died. When she sees them, she finally accepts Yusuku's death, and the two head back to Bantam for a drink. The barkeep eventually confronts her and tells her that she needs to accept that he's gone. He left because he didn't want to burden her with his death. She thanks Kiryu and finally calls him by his real name. This story overall is just so sad. This woman that can't face the fact that her boyfriend is gone and then learning that he truly is gone forever. And then at the end, for some reason, she gives us the engagement ring she just got, which is weird. I took them to Ibisu Pan and got 150,000 yen for them. I have no shame. Yakuza 4's side content is really good. There's just so much to do here, and they definitely didn't skimp on including everything they could. The team definitely went full bore on giving each character their own activities to complete and made it all unique to each individual. It's entertaining, fun, and just as interesting as the other entries in the series. Overall, Yakuza 4 is a really stellar entry in the series. It's one of the most ambitious ones so far. 
It took so many risks, not only with its structure, but its gameplay, characters, story, and environment. The team was really trying to step outside of the box with this one and revolutionize the series moving forward. They wanted to change things, and they did exactly that. This game is a very important step in the series, making Yakuza what it is today. The story itself comes together so well, developing each character individually and developing their antagonists as well. It somewhat has four independent stories that all come together in the end to form one large narrative that is just so well done and masterfully crafted. The new characters are incredibly well developed and so likable. Akiyama is easy to sympathize with. He's been wronged so many times but has had fortune thrown in his lap and just wants to do good things for people. Saijima has been wronged as well, and was just trying to do right by the Tojo and his best friend, but was sentenced to prison for that, even though he kind of tried to kill 18 people. Tanimura is fervently searching for his father's killer and just wants answers, but they're all kind of bad guys. Akiyama is lazy and takes serious motivation to get him to do things. Saijima is thought to be a cold-blooded killer, and Tanimura is barely a police officer, just gambling his days away. But this was a genius direction to take the characters. We've only played one character so far that's basically the strongest person out there and does right by everyone he comes across. He's honorable to a fault and does good at every opportunity. These guys aren't Kiryu though. They're trying to live up to his name, to do right by their families, by Kamarocho and themselves. Kiryu isn't something you can be, it's something you aspire to. These men are doing their best in the shadow of the greatest thing Kamarocho has ever known, the dragon. All of these characters are welcome additions, though, flawed individuals that are trying their hardest, determination in their heads and good hearts in their chest. They all make for compelling characters to play and act as an engaging part of the story. Yakuza 4 makes sweeping changes to the series, but they're reflected in the gameplay as well. Time and effort was put into making sure that each character felt individual, and playing them felt like a new experience with each one. There's definitely some downsides to the combat, and I think there were some steps taken backwards in that area, but nothing that could really ruin what the game was trying to do. Yakuza 4 is a really good entry in the lineup, and is one that I feel like doesn't get talked about enough. It's definitely higher up in the rankings, but deserves to be included with the best of the Yakuza games. Yakuza 4 received positive reviews, critics giving praise to the new direction the series took, but also noting that it wasn't always the most engaging. It did well in sales, selling over 384,000 units in its first week on the market. Of course, with RGG's incredible work ethic and insane amount of production, they would immediately begin work on the next entry in the series. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.